Good, but Vish, thanks very much for being here. Um, we have an hour and a half. Vish will speak for like 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then it's open up, open to everyone. But we always start with students, so you're you're all encouraged to participate. And then afterwards, we'll have time together with Vish the reception. So Vish, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, this I'm going to keep within reach. I'm going to cough my way through this presentation. Um, <clears throat> Now, the last time I was here, it was the BRE program, and it's really wonderful to be back. Um, <clears throat> I'm sitting in the wrong place. This so I'm going to um, sort of cut into the South African situation um, slightly differently. Um, I'm going to be talking about a conjunctural shift in South African politics. Um, and a conjunctural shift away from market democracy in the 20 years of, over 20 years of neoliberalization to something that I think we're all grappling with trying to characterize. Uh, it's a shift away from deep globalization to, um, again, some kind of um, radical economic transformation in inverted commas. So there's something going on in the political economy of South Africa, and I'm going to try and kind of uh, sort of work it out with you. Now, I want to start off by thanking <coughs> one of our lead cartoonists and political satirists in South Africa, Shapiro, uh, Jonathan Shapiro. Um, I got his permission to use a lot of his cartoons. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to work. Um, a lot of the humor is context-specific, and it's informed by, by nuance uh, in the South African context. But um, I'll kind of flesh them out. Um, I mean, they're little vignettes of very important developments. And uh, hopefully, we can giggle together, because I, I giggle and laugh at them. And then the others, are, oh, of course, and then thanking Patrick and Nitsan and um, Ellen and Laura for making things happen and work. Um, okay, just, just for those of you um, kind of trying to wrestle with South Africa and so on, I just, I just put up the slide knowing that there were going to be students in the room. Um, apartheid uh, was inaugurated in 1948 through the rise of the National Party, and I'm not going to give that history. But just to say that there's an important body of sociological thought, uh, historical sociology, if you like, comparative sociology, and it's grounded and it's shaped in the South African context to explain the racial ordering of the social order. Uh, one perspective on it was that this was the making of a fascism um, in the work of Bunting. Uh, another view from the Communist Party in South Africa is that we lived through 40 years of colonialism of a special type, where you have the oppressor and oppressed uh, located in the same spatial um, area. Um, and, of course, race and class worked in reinforcing ways. And then, of course, the idea of racial capitalism, that um, racism was then the originary moments of capitalism in South Africa, in its first mercantile encounter with uh, Dutch mercantilism. And race continued from there into slavery and into the industrial society that grew up. And then, of course, uh, a liberal view on capitalism and race in South Africa has argued in the literature that racism has been an aberration and that in the end you could price out racism and the market will march forward and liberate and emancipate all of us. But sadly, uh, post-apartheid, the end of formal racism, uh, economic apartheid is very salient, very much alive in South Africa. So the liberals have a case to argue uh, against. So, uh, but basically the point is this is living with 40 years of deep, uh, structured, socially patterned uh, racism uh, doesn't mean that um, after 20 years that it's completely disappeared. In some quarters in our society, this hardcore, hard right racism is very much alive. And this cartoon is basically about a group of students, um, white students who beat up a black student who was having a relationship with a white student. And Zapiro is basically saying that, well, you know, um, this cancer is not dead. It's there. It's come back. Um, at a university in our country, University of Free State, again, white students did something very repulsive. 
uh, and basically gave a clean of green to drink, for example. And, and these are bastions and these are spaces where this hard racism is still very, very much alive in that society. Okay. So for Wood was the architect from about 1959 to 1966 of higher party. And he basically led the National Party at that time, and it was really about Bantustans being proliferated, and separate development, and so on. And you know, he was shaped uh, in Germany, and that's where he studied. And so many people believe that a lot of his ideas of genetic racism also kind of were shaped in that context. But the point about this is that it's continued. Um, it's, it's still alive in some quarters in our society. Uh, of course, apartheid was resistant, and it threw up national liberation movements. Um, Mandela's ANC, which I'm sure most of you know, was at the forefront of that fight in many ways. Um, and of course, it was in alliance with the South African Communist Party for many, many decades, um, and, and particularly from the 90s, the Congress of South African Trade Unions. There were other liberation movements. Um, I mean, some of the mythologies around the South African struggle tend to reduce that struggle just to the ANC and Mandela, but there were others as well. There was the Pan Africanist Congress, there was the Azapo, there's the Indian People's Organization, uh, a derivative from black consciousness. And then there was the United Democratic Front in the 1980s, a convergence of civil society, <coughs> society formation. And this is just by way of background. Um, and then, of course, the post-apartheid electoral context is very important to keep in mind. Um, we have a, a liberal, um, I shouldn't say this, we have a constitutional democracy. And I don't think it can be reduced to just being a liberal democracy. I think the, the constitution can be read in much more radical ways in terms of its uh, impulses and in terms of its offering to that society. Um, but what you see, essentially, is that the ANC has loomed large in the electoral arena. And you know, it wins the 94 election, again with the majority, 99, 2004, and then you begin to see again a kind of drop. It's almost as though 2004 was the high point, and it's uh, kind of a peaky. Um, and there's a whole set of debates about this, given uh, the, the kind of electoral shifts that have come to the fore in local government elections that happened recently, and I'll say something about that, sure. So, <coughs> I'm gonna be framing this conjunctural analysis around this notion of Zoomification. Uh, and it's in reference to our sitting president, Jacob Zuma. And that basically, um, there's a bit of a timeline around sort of Jacob Zuma's uh, uh, political fortunes. So he was the deputy president of our country at the Bacon, and he was dropped from the cabinet in 2005 uh, because he was implicated in corruption related to a, a sort of big arms deal in South Africa. And there were 783 criminal charges slapped on him. Uh, Zuma responds by unleashing a kind of masculinist, ethnic um, uh, uh, populism uh, in the streets. And he basically builds a coalition of forces um, against Mbeki and, and against uh, what's happening to him. Uh, he's also implicated in a rape trial. He's charged in 2005 and 2006. It's the center stage of South African political life. And what Zuma and his forces succeed in doing is putting the woman on trial in the streets. Okay. And, uh, and again, a very max masculine, very gendered approach to this whole thing. Um, and it's interesting, t-shirts that were being sported out there, 100% Zulu boy, I mean, the language that was being used on the streets, I, I just don't want to quote it, okay. but despicable stuff. Um, I mean, essentially, she was being reduced to being a prostitute in the everyday common sense conversation and so on. Um, but he was using this mass um, kind of populist fervor, congealing it and, and, and congealing it up and so on, um, to fight the fight inside the ANC. Because the ANC was going to a very important conference called the Polyborne Conference in 2008, which was an electoral conference, uh, which would have changed the leadership. And Zuma knew that to survive politically, he needed to capture the ANC. He needed to come to the fore. So the rally uh, around his rape trial, 
the rallying in the streets against our constitutional court, against the constitution, and, and a whole narrative was spun around a conspiracy. And Zuma was the victim. Uh, more than that, Zuma was constructed as a people's hero. Classical populism, which I'll come back to just now. Uh, here was a man of the people. Here was a man of traditional rural South Africa. And he was a victim of the modern elites in South African society. And so he, that narrative and that politics goes into the ANC, into the Polokwane Conference, and Mbeki is dethroned and uh, Zuma clinches control of the ANC. He becomes the president of the ANC. Uh, he becomes president of the country in 2009. <coughs> in 2012, we have uh, the Marikana massacre uh, in August, um, and, uh, 12, and 34 mine workers have gone down mercilessly. Um, and of course, um, uh, there's a whole commission of inquiry, which I'll come back to, uh, which the Piro calls the, the mission inquiry. Um, and then, of course, there's the Inkandla scandal, which has got to do with the spending of 243 million rands of public funds to build a private dwelling for the sitting president. I mean, that's almost a quarter of a billion rands. It's a lot of money. Okay, and so I have in context in which inequality is going up, poverty is going up. You have youth unemployment sitting at 60%. Um, anyway, so it was a major scandal, Inkandla scandal. Uh, he becomes president again in 2014, and by 2015, um, there's clearly a move. Um, various ministries are beginning to show morbid signs of being captured. So there's a whole transactional politics taking root in South Africa, where ministries and departments are kind of being used to channel finance and capital. Um, there's, there's influence coming from outside the state uh, in that nexus to also uh, shape where these contracts go, uh, the provisioning happens, and so on. And so um, there's talk of capture of the state increasingly. But it's clear that Zuma has his sights set on the national treasury because the national treasury, albeit a neoliberal treasury, but committed to governance, committed to having tight controls, fiscal controls on how money is spent and so on, is a bulwark against this kind of creeping um, kind of takeover and capture of the state. And so he drops the finance minister in, in, in around December 2015 and he replaces him <coughs> with an unknown backbencher. Uh, markets rally, civil society rallies, there's an outcry, the, 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 the rand plummets, um, there's massive economic fallout. Billions are lost and wiped off our stock exchange. Um, our banks are suddenly vulnerable to buyout, etc., etc. And actually, from some of the fact finding that was done around this moment, it seems that the banks went into the house um, and basically engaged the ANC and told them, "Listen, you are setting us up for failure here. Our banks will be bought out on Monday, uh, basically." And so, what happens in that context? is that he backtracks, and he backtracks very fast. Um, but in that whole moment, things are revealed. Things and a whole set of questions get asked about where are decisions being made uh, to replace the finance minister. And it's very interesting that um, the former deputy finance minister, who was sh shuffled out of the cabinet a few weeks ago, uh, comes public and says that he was invited to the Saxonwald Shabin mansion. Now, the Saxonwald mansion is a mansion owned by an infamous family called the Gupta family. And they are part of this uh, network with the Zuma family, okay, engaged in this transactional politics. Uh, Ajay Gupta is a billionaire in South Africa, largely because of all this transactional stuff. And basically, this deputy finance minister was saying he was invited there, he was offered millions of rands to become the finance minister. And he basically told him basically he does not want to take up that position and he doesn't want the bag full of money. And that becomes a very powerful bit of damning evidence and it throws up a whole national debate about who's making decisions. Is there a shadow cabinet at the, uh, you, you live near, near the state, right? 
near the Saxon Roman state. Um, and there's a, there's a whole national discussion. Is Zuma running the state? Or is it the Gupta that's running this? Or is it the Gupta-Zuma nexus that's running the state? And so where are decisions being made? And so on. And as a result, the state capture report um, is triggered. Um, we have a public protector. It's a, a, a constitutional institution in South Africa. And Tuli Manansela, uh, our public protector at the time, basically was triggered by three citizens um, wanting an investigation into all of these issues. And the state capture report was produced, which is extremely damning in showing these connections and the different forces involved. She tried to interview Zuma in that whole process because she has that kind of legal muster and authority and so on. And he's, <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a leak of the interview with him. It's extremely evasive when it comes to the questions and answers and so on. But anyway, she pieces it all together. And in the end, she, <coughs> call, <coughs> she calls for a commission of inquiry, not constituted by the president, but constituted by the head of the constitutional court, because he's implicated in all of this. <coughs> And this doesn't go very far, but in the end, of course, um, Zuma does get his way. A few weeks ago, our cabinet was reshuffled. Um, the finance minister that replaced what we call the weekend special in South Africa, Des Van Royen, after three days, he was replaced by the minister of finance, Perrine Gordon, who was a previous finance minister. Uh, he was shuffled out of the cabinet uh, together with his deputy. and. Uh, Right now, the economy is in free fall in South Africa. And, um, and there's a whole set of questions about where to, what's happening. So various institutions have been captured, uh, have been compromised, the integrity of these institutions. Is the Reserve Bank next? Is the 2019 elections going to be stolen? Is our IEC going to be compromised? I think there's a whole set of questions in the national conversation, given the trajectory and given where we are going. So basically, it's a pure saying that um, <laughs> South Africa is like a chunk of meat. You know, Bryface is a national tradition. And um, you can see the looters. Now, Zuma has a shower on his head in all the Piro's cartoons. Okay? And that's very, very deliberate. Okay? Because the Piro is all about insulting the president. He's saying, as long as you rule in the manner you rule, with impunity, with self-interest, I'm going to mock you to the hilt. Okay, and the shower has to do also with the rape trial. Zuma's response in the rape trial because his victim, Kwesi, um, also had HIV AIDS, and Zuma's response to that was, "Well, after sex, I had a shower." Okay, and that set back gender politics in South Africa dramatically. Okay, here's the number one citizen of our country treating this pandemic ravaging our society, ravaging the region as a joke. Okay. So Zapiro puts the shower head on, on Zuma. So you'll see that a lot in what follows. Just some conceptual and analytical issues. Um, so this idea of kleptocracy, uh, you know, in the development literature, there's a whole set of synonyms for this: patrimonial regimes, neo-patrimonial regimes, clientelist, predatory, um, and it's very much uh, used in relation to developmental states. You know, so Peter Evans' work and so on, right? So. I think as we talk through this kind of situation in South Africa, I think I, I beg you to ask the question with me, what kind of state formation is happening here in the South African context? Is it a kleptocratic state okay, in the making? Is that what we're witnessing? Is that what we're living through? And so on. And there are various predatory dimensions to it, which I allude to, and so on. Democracy, also a very important concept. Um, uh, as we know in the social sciences and in political and democratic theory, but democracy also very contested idea. I mean, it's classical definition and meaning, ruled by the people, the demos. But as we know, <coughs> in its modern incarnation, democracy has also taken on um, different characteristics. So liberal democracy gives us certain rights-based guarantees and so on. But I want to go further to say that um, Liberalism has also developed an anti-democratic tendency, particularly in its incarnation as neoliberalism, in which the power of corporations trumps sovereignty and even the rights of citizens. And so you're seeing a hollowing out of democracy. 
And in a way, 20 years of neoliberalization in South Africa uh, has already put a squeeze on democracy, if you like. Democracy has been ritualized and formalized. Uh, we've had five national elections. People come out and they vote and so on and so on. But the nature of democracy in South Africa has eviscerated the power of citizens' agency. Okay? It's de-radicalized civil society in many ways. Our trade union movement has been falling apart. Powerful force for democratization coming out of the 1980s. It's now fragmented and divided. So the new federation that's just been born is a positive development. But again, um, in a context in which you know we have over 300 unions uh, that are formally on the books and probably another three, 400 that are illegal in South Africa. Populism, also a very important analytical category for this conversation. Um, you know, populism has its roots actually in this country, you know, in the prairies. And this idea of the PO producers versus the elites in the coastal cities. Uh, Narodinism in Russia has its place in Latin American politics and so on. We're seeing its resurgence. In, in, in Europe today and so on. But populism is also a very difficult concept to nail down. And a, and a minimal definition around it would be that it's, it's about evoking the people. Uh, it's about constructing a particular notion and understanding of the people, uh, speaking for the people uh, and so on. But it's also about othering. And so it others either elites or in others, minorities. Um, so, so, you know, Jacob Zuma speaks against white monopoly capital. Uh, he speaks against clever blacks in South Africa. So if you're educated and you're middle class and probably wear glasses, you're a clever black in his discourse. Okay? And he rails against these kinds of elites and so on. And then, of course, um, there's the idea of the general rule of the people. This is a Rousseauian idea. Uh, but I think that's a minimal kind of understanding, and I think the challenge that populism poses for us is an empirical one. And I think we always got to find it in context. We've got to pin it down in context. And so <coughs> I tried to do that also in this presentation to some degree. But in that context, we've got to ask questions. What is its class belonging? How is it organized? Uh, does it articulate with the host ideology, for example? So in South Africa, um, Jacob Zuma's populism articulates with the ideology of national liberation, uh, the national democratic revolution. Uh, when he talks about radical economic transformation, it's an articulation within that imagining, in that conception, ideological framing. Uh, we've got to, we, so, so, so I think these are some of the issues we're going to work out as, as, as we go down this road together. So, very quickly, this is. Uh, an attempt to kind of set the stage for understanding the kind of march of kleptocracy. So this is a Halloween cartoon. Um, I decided to introduce it because most Americans are familiar with Halloween. <laughs> but, um, but the point about this cartoon is that you have different uh, ministers, um, you have different state agencies. So whether it's the head of SABC Broadcasting, whether it's the head of the NPA, Sean Abrahams, whether it's auxiliary organizations of the ANC, like the ANC Youth League, whether it's the head of the South African Revenue Service or the Guptas, they are all part of this carnival and this festival of feeding off, if you like, uh, the nation. Um, and so it's cronyism on the march, or on the march, on the march, and it's not just one day in the year. I mean, basically, the point that Sir Piro is trying to register with us is that this is becoming systemic. Okay, it's taking, it's finding deep roots in our society, right? This is kleptocracy two, um, and it's a very interesting dimension of what's going on in South Africa, and it's the criminalization of our state agencies that are meant to be protecting us. So here, <coughs> you see a whistleblower called O'Sullivan, who was poised to kind of reveal a whole lot of information related to that fellow there, Palani and others centrally involved in the South African police services and corruption. But what happens to O'Sullivan? <coughs> O'Sullivan gets criminalized. The whistleblower gets criminalized. Okay? He gets charged with disturbing the peace and so on. And the police agencies 
and so on, basically turn on him and one of his close collaborators. They are charged, they force march into our courts, etc., etc. Okay? So you, you, you begin to see this kind of strange shift in how the state is functioning, right? It's, it has a constitutional mandate, it's meant to be impervious to all these influences, it's meant to serve citizens, and so on, and suddenly it's now turning on citizens. Okay? Another dimension to kind of this kleptocratic thing, um, and again, in this one, you, the nuance is a bit complicated. The Zama Zamas, does anyone know what Zama Zamas are? You were in South Africa recently, you should know what Zama Zamas are. Okay. Zama Zamas are small scale illegal miners. Okay. And they basically go down these very dangerous mothball mines in South Africa. All right. And they try and recover what they was left. And so, you know, we've had some very dramatic and sad and tragic um, um, incidents with Zama Zamas getting trapped underground and things like that. Okay. But what's interesting is that Zapiro juxtaposes uh, to the Zama Zamas, the Zuma Zumas, which is basically Zuma and all his cohorts and how they increasingly use the state to secure mining interests. Okay. And the regulatory regime, uh, which increasingly becomes a regime of dispossession in South Africa. Okay. So you've got these miners who are just struggling, barely surviving, life-threatening in what they do, and so on. And you've got those at the apex of the state, using the state to secure these interests. And so let me give you an example. So coal, coal mining in South Africa, there are lots of reserves that are talking about it. And um, Eskom has a monopoly, it's a state parastatal in terms of coal and energy production. And um, it has put into place uh, serious deals that benefit the, the, the Zuma group, the families, basically. Okay. <coughs> that runs into billions of rands. All right. And a lot of these transactions um, were not subject to due diligence, they were not subject to proper procurement procedures and policies, etc. And, and in the main, you know, overnight, people have become super wealthy because of these transactions and so on. Right. So, uh, Zapiro speaking to the kind of double standards that are at work here. The other dimension to the kind of kleptocratic practice that's taking root is this kind of personalistic style of leadership. And where, in a sense, you have currency, you have political currency if you are within the fold of the president, if you're within the kind of political cover that he can give you, the protection, like a racket. You know. So what's interesting here is, you know, we have some protected species <laughs> in South Africa, rhino, so they're almost being wiped out now, uh, pangolin, elephant, and so on. One of the protected species in South Africa is Shlaudi Matsune. And Shlaudi Matsune heads up the South African Broadcasting Corporation and he refuses to go despite court rulings and so on against him. He's like the CEO. Um, he's basically a person there with protection from what we call number one, the president. Okay. He's running the corporation into the ground. Uh, it's become a propagandistic voice or the ruling party, uh, you don't watch the news, uh, and so on. And, and basically, he just constantly reincarnates himself. So despite rulings that he must go, he comes back and he, he claims another position, he occupies his office, and he's just in our faces, constantly. He now has become a celebrity personality who hosts his own press conferences and so on. And um, he's a protected species in South Africa, he's untouchable. Okay? But it's not him alone. Okay, so this is the point about it, it's emblematic. There are those who are within this kind of zone of influence uh, that are also protected and so on and so on, uh, that cannot be pushed out. And then of course, now one of the things we inherited from apartheid was uh, state institutions, relatively effective actually. In 1970s, apartheid planners were talking about industrialization on the scale of South Korea, for example. They were having a hard-nosed discussion about this. 
Uh, but they built other institutions. They built um, the Industrial Corporation ISCO. They built, um, I mentioned uh, Eskom. Eskom was one of the it was one of the leading global energy corporations in the world. It had world class capacities in terms of planning and so on and so on. We inherited a lot of the stuff, uh, including transport, parastatals, and so on. But a lot of these state-owned enterprises are in a mess right now. Okay, they're in a state of degeneration and decline. They've been completely mismanaged. Uh, they've become a feeding trough. Now, this is the Minister of Transport, who has literally run our transport system into the ground. Uh, part of our national pride has been our South African Airways. Um, I've been very loyal uh, member of South African Airways, uh, always from South African Airways. I don't fly anymore. Um, but um, all of it is tied into this transactional politics, okay? And, um, and it's impacting not just on transport, it's impacting on energy. I mentioned the Eskom story. Most recently, 17 million South African citizens almost never got their monthly social grants, okay? Uh, and that's because the minister in charge uh, just wasn't dealing with this issue, okay? And, um, and it all had to do with a whole lot of transactional stuff going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, there's almost a meltdown also going on in the States in relation to the kind of capturing um, and, and, and the corrosion and so on and so on. <coughs> so that's the kind of dimensions around kleptocracy that are coming to the fore in South Africa. So um, it might sound typical in relation to literature, but it's also context specific. Um, it's got to do with a particular level of development. It's got to do with a particular society and so on. Now, in terms of democracy, uh, there are a whole set of questions coming to the fore. And Zapiro helps us grapple with what's happening also in terms of democracy. So here's a cartoon with the fi former finance minister going to parliament to sing the virtues of good governance and so on. But what Zapiro does is that he places the Saxon wall shabine in relation to parliament. And basically, Brian Molefe, who was the former CEO of ESCO, uh, well, cheers to the finance minister. Uh, and the idea here was that um, he's not going to last very long. Rumor has it that you're going to be replaced, basically. So while you've done all this great work on the budget speech for 2017 and so on, um, you're on your way out, basically. And that decision has been made not in Parliament, okay, where you're going to give this august and important budget speech, but this decision has been made somewhere else, okay, in the Saxon Wall. Right. So basically, there's a shadow space, if you like, in which decisions are being made around ruling the country, appointments to cabinet positions, and so on. And, and that, that poses a very serious challenge to the nature of our democracy. Who's ruling South Africa? The very fundamental question uh, all of us are asking right now. Is it the president and the cabinet guided by the constitution or is it a set of <coughs> other nefarious forces? There's been a consistent attack on legal rights and rights discourse. And you know, in this slide, uh, Zapiro provides a catalog, if you like. Uh, the Marikana massacre, uh, the social grant crisis where citizens were denied their social grants. See, the main issue has got to do with uh, mentally ill patients who were taken out of um, care and put into an NGO space, and many, many of them died. Okay? Um, and a whole lot of other transgressions vis-a-vis -vis citizens' rights. Uh, our constitutional court um, was uh, robbed recently of all its computers. This is a a crucial institution in our democracy alongside our parliament and alongside our cabinet. It's a crucial check on power. But all its data of all 400 judicial officials was stolen, taken. Okay. Parliament was robbed the other day, um, particularly in office housing journalists and so on. There's all kinds of strange things going on in democracy right now. Um, and so Zapiro is basically kind of saying, well, Human Rights Day comes and Zuma pays lip service to it, right? It lights a candle. Um, but it's all in this context in which, again, rights are being uh, eviscerated. Uh, this is a very interesting cartoon because it's really the pushback by Zuma et al. vis-a-vis -vis freedom of speech. 
Okay. At the beginning of this year, they tabled a, a, a bill, uh, a hate speech bill. And in the hate speech bill, there was a very broad formulation of hate speech. So even cartoonists like Sapiro were suddenly facing the guillotine. Okay? You were facing criminal charges and so on and so on. So there was a strong attempt to limit dissent, if you like, coming through in the formulations inside this, uh, this hate speech bill. So you can see Zapiro even, he's there, he's inside, he's hiding under the constitution as a tent. And there's this bulldozer coming to wipe them out. Okay? Him and other artists and so on, um, who basically <laughs> try to defend themselves. Okay. <coughs> the abuse of security cluster institutions, besides the criminalization, is interesting in South Africa. This was the former Minister of Finance. Who, who, on the eve of his budget speech this year, was facing potential criminal charges. Uh, there was, you know, you have the FBI in South Africa, and we have a thing called the Hawks, and they were very consciously targeting him with all kinds of charges and so on and so on. And he was being harassed publicly. Uh, he was being summoned. They have legal authority to summon him to give statements on potential investigations and so on. And so this is it, this is the, the paradox, you know, we caught him red-handed trying to run the country properly. Um, and that's, that's exactly what's going on, okay? Um, and so, and then this is, this is the other thing about the crisis of our democracy. So the Marikana massacre happens, and there's a commission of inquiry set up, and you know, headed by a judge called Father. And what's intriguing is that after spending lots of money and spending a lot of time, this Father Commission report holds nobody accountable. So the Minister of Police is not held accountable for anybody else sitting in our national cabinet. Um, it basically lets off the executive of any responsibility. It seems to spotlight sort of some managerial problems, and particularly as it relates to the former General Piecha and one or two others. So senior police management are taking a hit for the Marikana massacre. Okay. So for many people in civil society and sort of um, activist groups and the media and so on, this is really a cover-up that's happened. Uh, there hasn't been any serious responsibility for the Marikana massacre coming out of the Father Commission report. There hasn't been any serious attempts to deal with what has happened there. So, Zapiro calls it the What year was the massacre? Uh, 2012. So, Zapiro calls it the omission of the inquiry. Um, so, here you see uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. He's the deputy president um, of the country and of the ANC. He was a shareholder in the mining corporation implicated in the Marikana massacre. And there was evidence tabled even before the, the fall of commission about him communicating to the Minister of Police around the need for a particular kind of response and so on. A lot of strong circumstantial evidence which should have led to criminal charges even out of this commission of inquiry. Nothing of that happens. Okay. So, so I just gave you some dimensions of the crisis of democracy in South Africa. Um, and now I kind of want to transition into, into how am I doing the time? Into kind of populism, a few cartoons of populism. So Zuma reshuffles his cabinet a few weeks ago, and um, it's all done in the name of radical economic transformation. And uh, well, <laughs> we reach junk status. Um, immediately two rating agencies nail us. Um, our currency loses a lot of value very quickly. The cost of borrowing for us goes up dramatically in foreign markets. Um, the cost for the poor are, are dramatic. The impacts are dramatic. Okay, uh, and so so we are we are now entering this 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 shift um, away from neoliberalization towards this unknown called radical economic transformation. There's no theory guiding this idea. Um, it's based on a state of the nation address given this year in which this language was evoked. Um, there's no serious basis for what it all means. 
uh, programmatically as well. Um, a current advisor to the new Minister of Finance has been talking about nationalizing everything um, and so on and so on. So on the other hand, the Minister of Finance comes to New York and he gets whacked uh, by financiers and he, he silences his advisor. So we're not sure what it all means, really. Okay, so. And then, of course, <coughs> I think the point about the zoomification of South Africa is that we are sitting in a place where it's almost as though the political standard for us as South Africans is that everything is up for sale. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you have these Black Friday sales here in America. We now have Black Friday sales too. Okay. And, um, but in the context of Zuma South Africa, everything is for sale. All right. Uh, prosecutors, our principals, our parastatals, our state organs, our cabinet ministers, everything, everything is for sale. So if you've got money, you can transact. If you've got money, you can buy political influence. Okay? Uh, that's, that's where we're sitting right now. And that means, of course, that um, for Zuma, it's, um, it's also in the interest of people, you know. Um, he's a people's man, uh, he's setting a people's standard, uh, and you can only understand what defeat would that mean. And then, of course, there's a gendered attack on our democracy, and it goes back to his rape trial. And, um, and of course, the chauvinism and the masculinist politics that comes out of that rape trial, and which continues uh, with zoomification. Uh, and Zapiro, rather crassly though, um, you know, he kind of shows how with the cabinet reshuffle, uh, on the one hand, you have the New Age and the ANN7 news channel, which is controlled by the Gupta Zuma families. You have state organs, security state organs, and other uh, ministries basically saying, well, do what you want. Okay? On this particular cartoon, um, at the local government elections, um, uh, Independent Electoral Commission uh, headquarters, when results were finally being announced and so on, and Zuma was about to speak, a group of uh, feminist activists stood in front of the stage and basically said, remember Quest, that was the woman that was raped by him, and, um, um, and basically reminding him about it, reminding South Africa that one in three women are raped in that society. And, and these women solicited an almost violent response from all the auxiliary forces of the ANC, the ANC Women's League, and from the ministers in Zuma's cabinet, and so on and so on and so on. And many of them women as well, condemning these feminists for taking the stand, etc. Okay? So the kind of gender politics of this pop populism is, is a lot to be decided. Another dimension to this populism is how street politics is also used, if you like, uh, to put popular pressure against uh, enemies of the people. So what you see here is a march by the ANC UK to APSA Bank. APSA is one of four banks in South Africa. And there have been all kinds of issues around banks and so on in South Africa. After <coughs> Zuma dropped Nene as finance minister in December of 2015, all banks in South Africa refused to have bank accounts associated with the the, the, the Gupta family. As a result, uh, Zuma decided that this should be a national priority to unlock the banks. He made it a priority in his cabinet. He put pressure on the former Minister of Finance, Praveen Gordon, to uh, try and uh, put pressure on the banks. He refused. He actually went to court to affirm that he doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, so what happens? The auxiliary forces are unleashed. The youth league marches to APSA Bank, okay, and basically um, condemning the enemies of the people. But you see similar things along the way. Um, you know, we've had some very provocative art in South Africa, depicting Zuma in very critical ways. Um, so again, the auxiliary forces have marched. You've had marched galleries in South Africa as well uh, to remove pieces of art and so on, and so on that offend uh, the great leader. And of course, populism is global. It is global. And this is 
like Zuma astounded that there's somebody with a bigger and brighter shower head than him. <laughs> and the golden shower head belongs to none other than Donald Trump. And, um, and, and, um, and the point here is that, you know, uh, Zapir is telling us that it is global. Okay. It's a phenomenon. Um, not <coughs> exceptional. Um, <coughs> So there are various consequences that come out of the kleptocratic makings of uh, state formation, uh, the crisis of our democracy, the rising authoritarian populism in South Africa. The one consequence has been um, to try to use the power that our constitution gives us to fight back. And so Tuli Madonsela, our public protector, did just that. She did an investigation, as I alluded to earlier on, and she affirmed that the president breached ethical obligations in terms of decision making around cabinet appointments and so on. And in her report, she calls for a <coughs> judicial, judicially headed commission of inquiry. But the evidence is damning. It shows capture that there's undue influence from sectors of our society, particularly the private sector, on the state right now. Uh, there's a nexus of relationships operating. The other consequence of all of this is an ANC center that's just not holding, an ANC that's falling apart, uh, and particularly very uh, revealing with the recent cabinet reshuffle, where the ANC top five initially were very divided and critical publicly of the, the decision that was made. After a meeting with Zuma, the top five closed ranks, the National Working Committee of the ANC closed ranks, and the entire ANC closes ranks around Zuma and his cabinet reshuffle. Uh, um, but again, it doesn't mean that it's not divided. <coughs> but it seems that his factual control of the ANC is much more coherent, is much more effective, much more organized, and he's able to use that in the ANC very effectively to deal with any opposition. At the same time, it doesn't mean that everyone in the ANC uh, agrees with where the country is going. So many of our stalwarts um, that have fought the struggle uh, for a very long time have broken ranks. Uh, there are numerous veterans in South Africa that have called for Zuma's resignation. But the most recent was a letter penned by Ahmed Katrada, who was a fellow um, prisoner with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island for many, many years. And he basically wrote a private letter to Zuma, appealing to him to step up as the president of the country, given what's been going on and so on. Katrada died um, a few weeks ago, and his funeral has become a rallying call for Zuma to resign, for Zuma to step down. And so and there's been various memorials across the country and so on and various people breaking ranks with the ANC, senior people, calling for Zuma to resign and so on. And this is a video uh, showing uh, one of the memorial services. Uh, there's an appeal made to, to the casket to say, one last time, Jay said, step down. Giving confidence to the people. I must say, I mean, uh, Ahmed Katrada taking the position he did has emboldened a lot of people in society to speak up and break silence. This is a very interesting cartoon in terms of consequences. Um, the ANC is losing electoral ground, and there's a lot of South African nuance that you have to appreciate about this cartoon. Jacob Zuma has constantly, and this is a refrain in this kind of public modus operandi, the ANC will rule until Jesus comes. <laughs> okay. And so, in the local government elections, there was a seismic shift against the ANC. It lost most major metropolitan governments to opposition parties and coalitions. And so Zapiro is saying, well, my friend Zuma, <laughs> Jesus has come. <laughs> okay. So it's lost a lot of ground. Um, and there's a big debate about 2019. Uh, the next national election is in 2019. There's a lot of detachments from the ANC Liberation Bloc, lots of realignments like the new trade union movement. Um, citizens um, are really, um, if you like, disaffected. It registered in this local government elections. And many people believe that if he continues with the kind of impunity um, that he's been displaying, that's going to register probably at the first major loss of national elections for the ANC. 
The other consequence of what we've been living through is um, the further kind of proliferation of populism and a kind of proto-fascism in our politics. So one of the one of the, the staunchest allies of Jacob Zuma was the Youth League president, uh, former Youth League president Julius Malema. Uh, Julius Malema stood in the streets in 2004, 2005, and attacked our constitutional court and spoke against um, uh, the woman in the rape trial and so on and so on. And he was willing to die for Zuma. And he's on record saying, "I will die for Zuma." Okay. So by 2012, uh, Julius Malema has a falling out with uh, Zuma, and he forms his own party, which essentially is a peeling away of the Youth League, uh, some parts of it, uh, and they form the Economic Freedom Fighters. The Economic Freedom Fighters is in many ways a populist party. Uh, it defines the people uh, in, in particular narrow ways, in particular racial ways. Um, it it articulates the land question um, akin to the kind of Zimbabwe model, so there's a resonance of that and its rhetoric and so on. Um, and it's, it's, it's not afraid to even, if you like, evoke the idea of racial war, going land reform and so on. And so, on the other hand, it also invents its position. So on the one hand, it's, it's Marxist-Leninist, uh, officially, on the other hand, it's, uh, it makes it up as it goes, uh, it's stakeholder capitalism and so on. Um, on the one hand, it's uh, very male, but yet some women are attracted to it. On the other hand, um, it's uh, constitutional. <laughs> on the other hand, it's very anti-constitutional. So it has these antinomies working in its politics and its practice. and. Um, and I would say that it doesn't adhere to one basic element of our democracy, which is a recognition of difference, and the fact that uh, in a constitutional democracy, difference should not be an antagonistic um, move. Um, the EFF has increasingly become violent in its disposition, in its theatrical performative politics in parliament, and even in societal processes. Okay? Um, and, and this is having particular implications alongside Zuma's version of the ANC for our democracy. The other consequence of Zumafication has been a counter movement from below, and it's really the people rising up. And since April 7th, um, there were, well, actually before that, a week before that, there were occupations outside the National Treasury Office when Zuma fired the finance minister and reshuffled his cabinet. Uh, people marched to union buildings, demanded his, um, his resignation. Uh, I was part of this, part of the co-organizers of this. Thousands of us marched. Uh, opposition parties also marched uh, after that. We built a lot of momentum nationally. We think we pulled out over 300,000 people on the streets on April 7th. Um, and there's lots more uh, coming. There's going to be a convention very soon uh, in the country to organize civil society and political parties. There's a motion of no confidence making its way through the parliamentary process. Zuma and them are trying to block it, of course. Uh, it's sitting in the constitutional court right now. The point of contention is whether it should be a um, secret ballot or not when MPs vote. Okay, because, because of the coercive politics of the ANC, Many MPs are afraid. <coughs> and then to conclude, basically, well, we, we're basically seeing the makings of a kleptocratic state in the South African context. It has its own specificity. It's related to a kind of accumulation. Um, it's dressed up as radical economic transformation, but it's eroding democracy in very, very serious ways. Uh, we are seeing populism come to the fore, it has different dimensions to it, it's authoritarian, it's male chauvinist, it's ethnic, uh, it's anchored in ANC factual control and presidentializing of power in the case of Zuma, uh, in the case of EFF it's anchored in its party machinery, and it's also eroding democracy in South Africa. And then of course, democracy itself is in a systemic crisis, as I said at the beginning, We've had 20 odd years of neoliberal democracy in South Africa, okay, where rating agencies have been more important than the programmatic votes of citizens. Okay. 
Um, but that has been further complicated by a second squeeze in our democracy, and that is this kleptocratic, authoritarian, ethno-populism that's marching through our society. So that's it. That is uplifting. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have about half an hour, and the tradition is we give the the, the floor to a first round of questions from students, and uh, Vish, I'll, I'll let you take questions, and you can answer one at a time, we'll take a bunch. Okay. Hi, my name is Alexa, I'm from Johannesburg, mm -hmm. and um, my question is that I think a lot of people have put the blame for like, persistent um, assault by government and serious cronies um, with civil society, and if, like, said that it's a failure of civil society to mobilize, that this is being continued, that like this has continued to happen. But I think my question is, if the state has been captured to the extent that it has, will civil society mobilizing actually be able to pressure the government to change? Good question. How do you want to do this? Should I respond? It's up to you. Okay, let me take one more question. Yeah. I wonder if you could speak to, I mean, you mentioned EFF briefly and DA. I'm wondering, in the rise of these, these alternative parties, is it right to see them, if we think about those values we talk about, democracy and populism, are they exogenous challenges to the summification process? Are they outgrowths that are just intensifying some of these things you're talking about? So DA has a neoliberalism of its own, perhaps, but maybe a different kind, but obviously neoliberal as well. EFF has a populism of its own, perhaps a different kind. In thinking about these, these these other alternative parties. I'm wondering, what is it that we get that would be different than the, the zoomification that we're talking about? Are they actual challenges? Are they changing some of these things you're talking about, these categories? Um, or are they just, you know, aspects of it that are just being intensified, essentially? Okay. Uh, let, me, let me respond to that. Um, okay, so, I mean, I, I really think, I'll take the, the last question first. I do think that we've got to locate it in the context of um, national liberation movements uh, in the 20th century, because that's where the ANC comes from. And <clears throat> national liberation movements um, have, if you like, um, been exhausted historically. We've seen that in the larger African context. And they've been through degeneration. Okay? After the Cold War, we've seen another wave of democratization in the African context. And, you know, if you look at Angola today, this breaks my heart. You look at Mozambique and so on and so on, you know. The kind of politics that's taking root is not emancipation. Okay. They have failed on their own terms to deliver emancipation to those societies. And, of course, complex for endogenous and external reasons and so on. Now, I'm not arguing that it's inevitable that the ANC will degenerate. That's not my argument. Some people argue this, by the way. Uh, somebody called Dale McKinley argues a thesis that the nature of African nationalism in South Africa, uh, being elite nationalism, was always going to betray the people. I don't argue that. But, but it's very clear that uh, in terms of contingency and what has happened uh, in our historical process, particularly post-apartheid, um, the ANC has made certain choices. The ANC as the party in power has made certain choices for the country. Okay. And, and, and as a result of that, <clears throat> it has locked us into a particular pathway. All right. So it has clearly decided to deracialize what was a deeply monopolized capitalism. It embraced the idea of black economic empowerment, which came largely from, from capital in South Africa. Uh, it chose modest redistributive reforms alongside that, so like social grants, like housing, and important, uh, important redistributive uh, reforms. But it hasn't had a project for fundamental structural transformation of that society. And as a result, it's gone down this pathway in which inequality has worsened. And there's a strange narrative in South Africa where some people argue that the apartheid was better than what we have, okay? given in, at a common sense level. Okay? 
uh, given the inequality, given the high levels of unemployment, I mean, almost 60% youth unemployment, okay? Over 26% official, narrow, narrowly defined unemployment, and so on, so on. And stubborn, being there consistently, and so on. So the ANC has gone down this path, and, and basically it's produced an unviable society, in my view. Okay? You cannot, if you like, sustain and consolidate a democracy on the trajectory that it's chosen. And in that process, it has also degenerated, and it has engendered forces uh, in that process uh, that sometimes look very much like it. The EFF looks like Zuma's ANC, in my view. Okay. So accentuating these tendencies of degeneration and so on. The institutional political scene in South Africa is really uninspired, in my view. Um, there's not much, it's, it's almost, you know, political scientists when they look at Africa today, they talk about choiceless democracies. It's almost like that, okay. If you were to choose between the DA and the ANC, they're not far apart in economic policy, you know what I mean? <coughs> so, so while there is this deep crisis, um, the, ch <coughs> the challenge, of course, is to find, find a way out um, that, if you like, crystallizes an alternative political project. None of the parties in the political space or the political horizon are offering that right now. And this connects up with your question. Um, I mean, I really think that uh, <coughs> we have, I just wrote a piece about the arrival of our Zimbabwe moment, and it was making the point that we will not be Zimbabwe because we have to be distinguished by certain things. We have a developed private sector in South Africa. Many people have made this point. Um, and right now, there's, there's trillions of rands sitting on balance sheets in South Africa. The state has had a very contradictory relationship with capital. It's made massive concessions, but it has not, and that's why it's not a developmental state. It has not been able to commandeer that capital and allocate that capital. But with where Zuma is going right now, a lot of that capital is very likely to go offshore, either illicitly or legally. Okay. We have a robust civil society, albeit been de-radicalized and so on, post-apartheid. And I would argue that there are two cycles of, 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 of resistance in post-apartheid South Africa, throwing up different kinds of movements, uh, movements defending democracy, constitutional rights, movements for systemic alternatives and transformation and so on. Um, and those are very, very important forces for placing limits on state power. Um, but you also have other dimensions to our society that are different and distinct. You have a robust intelligentsia in South Africa. And right now, if you look at a lot of the intellectual outpouring and conversation in South Africa, across black and white intellectuals, organic intellectuals, professional intellectuals, there's a deep concern for where the society is going. There are lots of books that capture this, uh, that have been written and so on. Um, there's, there's clearly a, a issue around um, our geopolitics as a country, okay? I mean, if capital unplugs uh, right now, um, we, we will crash into a recession. Right? We've just barely kind of kept our head above water, okay? That's gonna be a very serious situation. Um, and that's gonna put major limits on what Zuma can do, okay? Um, I mean, the one thing he would probably reach for is fiscal populism and bankrupting the state. But I think given, given the forces lining up right now, it's going to be very, very hard. Um, and given the election around the corner as well. Um, but the other thing related to this is, is how China and Russia are related to South Africa. And China, in my view, has been much more cautious as a neo mercantilist state. It has, it's, together with other BRICS powers, has skewed our economy in many ways, like around coal and other things. But it's not meddling in South African politics directly. Russia, on the other hand, and particularly around nuclear, today the courts, the high courts ruled that the nuclear deal uh, with Russia and other countries is unacceptable constitutionally. Which means that Zuma cannot go behind the back of parliament 
and lock the country into a nuclear deal. He has to go to Parliament. Okay. Um, but it's going to be very interesting to see how Russia deals with him. Because that's a mafia state. Okay. Uh, and the limits that places on what he does and doesn't do and so on. So. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that there are a whole set of forces, social forces, that are lining up in the battle lines that are being drawn in South Africa. Um, and I, you know, I think institutional political opposition is important, but it's not going to be all the only political force fighting the fight for the future of democracy in the country. Other questions? So I don't know if you could talk about the development of democracy in South Africa as compared to um, democracy, the development of democracy in a lot of other African nations, um, and specifically how um, the, the impact of the fact that South Africa's transition to democracy was relatively nonviolent as compared to a lot of violent transitions. Um, and not just what that means for right now, but also like in the coming years, given the state of South Africa's economy and the fact that a lot of other sub-Saharan African nations, their economies are growing very rapidly right now. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's take that question. Um, so, I mean, you know, the Africa rising narrative is an interesting one, and I think it's something that has to be deconstructed. And we have to look at it much more rigorously and closely. Um, and it's not given that, you know, where you're having high growth rates, you're necessarily having successful democracy in Africa. Um, actually, uh, the picture's a bit more complicated. Um, so whether it's in your oil-producing economies and your mineral-producing economies and so on, um, democracies are still very tenuous uh, in the African context. Um, I mean, you're also seeing the rise of typical, I don't like using this language because it's an important political science language, but you are seeing strongman politics uh, emerging in the African context, in Rwanda, in Uganda, and so on and so on. And, um, and maybe in South Africa, maybe going to be a strongman politics. Uh, if Zuma tears up the entire constitution, we there. Okay. Um, so so I, th I think the, the African context is much more complicated. Um, Many political scientists, particularly um, scientists who look at liberal electoral democracy as a benchmark of democracy, throw a lot of quantitative numbers around participation rates and so on, people like Diamond and other people, to affirm whether democracy is strong or weak and so on. So on. Um, and you've seen a lot of that over the past two decades. But, you know, it's interesting, as I've been saying, that um, the picture is much, much more complicated in the African context. And I would argue that there's a potential rollback happening. Okay. So if you look at an AU mechanism, like the African Peer Review Mechanism, which is meant to contribute to the constitutionalizing of liberal democratic norms and standards in Africa, the vast majority, or out of 54 countries, about 26 or 27 that have signed up to it. Okay. But even where you do have that kind of recognition of this mechanism, all right, in national contexts, tenuous dynamics coming to the fore and so on. Okay. Even these reporting standards that are meant to help you kind of make your progress, if you like, a lot of that is not very efficacious. Um, South Africa sometimes stands out in that context. I think that's my point. And that's why I think for many of us it's troubling. Because it, it has been the bearer, not of an exceptionalism, but of a standard, if you like. Okay, so a relatively peaceful transition. It wasn't all that peaceful. Um, and we were able to secure an institutionalizing of, if you like, political gains. Okay. And that's important. Um, and, and, I think, and I think that's the dilemma, and that's the fear, if you like. Uh, if we roll back, um, I mean, I think it has ramifications um, for the rest of the continent that are going to be dying. Yeah. So, um, I, could, I, I, I couldn't decide whether you, what you were saying about South Africa now 
reminds me more of the United States or Nigeria, the two places I know best in the world. Neither in thinking about the comparisons, neither of them complementary in the way that I'm thinking about them right now. Um, but my question is um, <coughs> to ask you to say a little bit more about what you think the relative, uh, I mean, it's, it's striking in the United States, but, but now in, in South Africa as well, the degree to which people seem to have this capacity to kind of vote against their, and act against their own class interests. And, and, and often I kind of see that as, well, you know, somehow politics manages to fool people to do things that are in favor of capital but not in favor of themselves. But, 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 but in your case, it looks like what's going on may not be in the interests of the people, but it may not be in the interests of capital either. Um, and so I'm just wanting you to say a little bit more about how, um, how you see the relative um, interests or strength of, of the people and capital is kind of playing out in this story. I mean, is there one that's more likely to be a good check on this than the other? Is, are both going to sort of, is capital going to flee and the people are going to follow populism and kind of go against their own interests? Is there some way they could align? I mean, I'm just, just a little bit more about that capital people relationship. That's interesting. So, you had so I uh, had a really good question about the nature of populism in South Africa. You said that the elite, the, the other elite that is constructed is the white population and the, the black middle class. So I was wondering what the people is and why do they support this, this guy? Because if they clearly, all of what you described doesn't seem to be working in the interests of any elites. So where does his support come from? An interesting question. Well, it's interesting, you know, in the uh, 2009 election, there was a massive swing in the province of KwaZulu Natal towards the ANC. Now that has been a very contested political space for the ANC for historical reasons. And it had to do with the presence of a uh, um, Zulu nationalist political organization called the Nkata Freedom Party, which was aligned previously to the National Party regime and so on. So, um, and the swing to the ANC was an ethnic swing to the ANC, okay? And what many people um, and analysts and academics have been saying is that Zuma has accentuated ethnicity in South African politics. He's Zuminous, okay? The swing in KZN was crucial um, for, for the shift in, in 2009, for the electoral shift in 2009. So, um, that's part of his construction of the people uh, as well. Okay, I'm traditional. I come from rural South Africa. I am Zulu. I'm a male, and so on and so on. Um, the other thing about it is that you know there's there's another level at which things work in South Africa, and it's it's got to do with how the ANC has claimed for itself uh, the mantle of liberation but also a conflation with the nation, the state, and the ANC. And, okay. and Zuma plays, plays off that, and he, 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 he harnesses that. Um, so it's been in the rhetoric of the ANC, you know, uh, better life for all, uh, for all the people, and, and so on. It's been in the Freedom Charter, you know. South Africa belongs to all living in black and white, and there's a lot of evocation of people's power in the freedom charter and so on. So, um, so he, at another level, he uses that. Okay, uh, we the ANC, we will rule, we will serve the interests of the people, and so on. So, on. so that's another level at which his construction is working. Okay, and he plays off that majority support in particular ways. Um, I mean, I think that. It's also going to come unstuck because a tribalizing of South African politics, which is anti ANC actually. Historically, the ANC has been a movement that's been primarily about unifying African people first and foremost, beyond ethnic cleavages. And beyond that, uniting the people of South Africa. So he, he, he's actually, in my view, stepped outside of what the ANC historically has been all about. Okay. And I think that's going to come back uh, to challenge him and the ANC in very, very serious ways. 
But the other thing about this is the idea of traditional authority. Interestingly, under Mandela, because uh, Mandela had a traditional dimension to him, and he wanted to bring back the power of traditional authority. But under uh, Zuma and so on, it's been further strengthened, traditional authority. Power being given to chiefs and so on. And so on. And there have been major battles um, waged by women's organizations, um, uh, constitutional right organizations, and so on, against some of the communal land tenure acts and so on, which essentially will disenfranchise rural South Africa and subordinate them to tribal power and authority. Um, it will also impact on women in very fundamental ways. Okay, they won't have power. They'll have to go to traditional authority spaces to adjudicate issues and so on and so on. So in a way, that's another dimension that's coming out here um, around the people and how it's working and so on. But there's a pushback there as well. Um, and because, you know, the traditional authority mapping in South Africa fits squarely onto the old apartheid uh, spatial realities that we've inherited and so on. And in many ways, tribal authority was eroded in many places and lost. And, um, and it's not given that that's going to be, again, an effective institution in, in, in traditional African society. Um, so I think there are a lot of contradictions in how the people are used, evoked, and so on. And there are counter forces as well uh, in all of this. Um, the, the, the biggest thing missing for me right now, which is a big challenge, is the voice of workers in South Africa. Because workers, as I said, were a democratizing force and could have been the most effective counterweight to this. And because Kosatu has been effectively factionalized by Zuma's ANC and literally captured, uh, it's been split and so on, um, it's creating a very serious crisis for where we are. In terms of the, I mean, this relates then to the, the people and the capital. And um, I don't see capital as heroic in South Africa, you know, I, and I'm not saying you saying that. But I really think that capital in South Africa could have done much more for post apartheid development. Uh, we, you know, for almost 20 years, the conditions for capital to thrive have been there in South Africa. We've uh, ensured exchange control deregulation. You know, if you like, the carrot has been dangled sufficiently. You know what I mean? And yet, um, we've had an investment strike in South Africa. It's incredible, you know? Um, we, and, and, and a pattern of capital intensive investment has continued. So a job shedding pattern of economic development has continued. It's uh, given our high unemployment rates and so on and so on. Many people argue in South Africa that we needed an economic kudesa in, in addition to the political kudesa that produced our constitution to really put in place a new social contract and a new national consensus um, and so on. But capital is powerful, it has structural power in South Africa. Uh, most of it is offshore. The large monopolies that grew up in South Africa, uh, most of them in the context of, the, if you like, the elite pact, uh, have moved offshore, most of them on the London Stock Exchange or on the US Stock Exchange. So they're not home-based, as in South African corporations. That gives them a lot of leverage. Um, they also use South Africa as a staging post to kind of penetrate the larger African economy. So the JSE, for example, has an Africa board and have lots of South African companies going into a larger African context. Um, but I, I haven't been convinced about the patriotism uh, of South African capital. I mean, the, the argument that gets made is that we pay our taxes, go to the fiscus, get on with it. And you know, I would argue a lot of that has to do with the nature of kind of rainbowist nationalism that came to the fore even during the Mandela period. Okay, we had to. We had to find a way to build confidence and so on and so on. But something else was needed and is missing in the South African context. Um, I mean, if you look at exploitation in South Africa and the precarity 
that's taken root post-apartheid. It's, it's awful, actually. Uh, I mean, the majority of workers, 70%, earn under 3,000 rand a month. And if you look at the wage gap in South Africa, post-apartheid South Africa, it is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, we, we become more and more a billionaire-based society, like many, you know, and so on and so on. The concentration of wealth is atrocious. Okay, it's despicable. Um, and yet, you know, people people are struggling to survive in South Africa. So, <clears throat> and that opens up the social order to various incursions, if you like, from all sorts of quarters. Okay. Um, it's interesting that a bunch of CEOs worked with the former finance minister to try and rebuild international confidence in the South African economy. And they traveled internationally to various financial centers and so on. But again, that didn't translate into a new social compact for South Africa. And I'm just wondering whether if the minister stayed in place, whether he would have taken it there. Uh, in the context in which we're deindustrializing, uh, we're becoming increasingly a commodity exporting economy and so on. Okay. Uh, a lot of those CEOs right now in business leadership South Africa, which represents a lot of these you know, big corporations and even transnational corporations, have taken a stand against the cabinet reshuffle. They publicly marched with us in the streets. Uh, we also haven't closed the door to them to march with us. Um, but I'm not sure how far they're going to go. Um, they're already talking about a rapprochement with Zuma and to have a dialogue with him and so on. Um, and so, you know, I mean, if, if Zuma is going to maintain a certain level of stability that keeps them happy, the fight's over, right, for them. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I think that, um, again, when it comes to the people, um, the crucial issue there is, is, again, the trade unions, the organized workers, and so on. And the formation of this new trade union movement with over 500,000 workers is a signal development. Um, they have taken a position against Zuma. They've been trying to have a national strike on this issue. Um, the permission has been turned down to do that. Um, the big challenge, of course, is whether they're going to converge with a whole set of other forces that are, that are emerging, if you like, in the people's space. Uh, there's an important campaign that has risen called Save South Africa. Uh, some of us worked with them. I'm not part of Save South Africa. We worked with them around the mass mobilization that took place to union buildings. Um, and they, together with a whole set of other movements and so on, uh, are talking about working together. Okay. Um, there's going to be, as I said, a convention uh, or a conference, whatever, uh, platform soon to try and bring all these forces together. Um, now, how that congeals, uh, what it focuses on, and so on, is anybody's guess at this point in time. Um, but I think for, for many people, 2019 is going to be a defining moment as well. Um, I mean, it's an election year. Um, and given all the kind of crisis dynamic, um, I mean, how that's going to express itself and just itself is going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, I, think I, I think I heard you say 80% unemployment among the youth. 60. 60. 60. What is the education level among South African youth? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm just curious about what you think the outcome of the ANC's leadership conference versus sustainable that's a good question. Um, you know, in 2014, um, there was a campaign in South Africa called Vote No. And it was really about the massacre that happened in Marikana, and it was about Inkanda. And it set up a platform for a national debate about how citizens use their voices and so on. The ANC closed, closed ranks against that campaign. Yet there were senior people from the ANC in that campaign, former cabinet ministers and so on. In 2015, when Intlancha Nene gets fired, it's interesting that the Zuma Must Go campaign that grows out of that, okay, 
still doesn't find resonance inside the ANC. But by 2016, given what's happening in the state and the corruption and everything, you're beginning to see increasingly um, inside the ANC powerful noises coming to the fore. Um, the, the challenge there is that Zuma has factionalized the ANC. He controls the faction. And it's relatively more coherent than anything else. Okay? And it's a, it's a faction that wields its political base and muscle. All right? It straddles the ANC Women's League. It straddles the uh, ANC Youth League. Um, it straddles certain key provinces. Um, cuts across its cabinet. Um, and so on. Um, and money is crucial for that faction. Okay? Uh, money and politics kind of go hand in hand. Okay? So it's very telling that the NWC of the ANC and the office bearers didn't take Zuma on, on his, on his reshuffle. Um, which again shows where the balance of forces lie inside the ANC. He survived it. Okay? He's confident. Um, and he's probably going to go into the national conference this year with all these forces lined up as I've described them. Okay? I think the dilemma for most people is that if you take him on, you'll split the ANC. Okay? And I think it's a serious dilemma, it's a serious issue. But I think people have to really ask themselves whether it's Zuma or the country. And that's the question in the end. Okay? Uh, it's not about the ANC anymore, in my view. Um, now, alongside this, the South African Communist Party, which has been a staunch ally of Zuma uh, and Kosatu, um, they both come out calling for his resignation. Um, and they, the Communist Party particularly is calling for a dialogue with progressive forces in society. I'm not sure where that's going to go whether that's about building for the battles inside the ANC conference process, or whether that's going to be about realigning political forces in South Africa for something different. Okay. So um, it's, um, it's a complicated situation. Um, but if, if the Communist Party and Kosatu develop the political will, to say enough is enough. And that the fact you can't solve this problem inside the ANC. Self-correction inside the ANC is not going to solve this problem. The rot is so deep, it's systemic. The ANC is implicated in this, in this regime in such deep and profound ways. You need a project of renewal that has to, that has to be something completely different. Okay. Um, and if they develop the will to go in that direction, there are a host of other forces in society, like the New Trade Union Federation, the Metal Workers Union, the largest union with over 300,000 members, saying they want a workers' party in South Africa. So there's immense potentialities for some kind of left convergence right now, and for some kind of left force to emerge in South Africa. Uh, but I just hope the Communist Party uh, sees beyond the ANC. The question of education, I don't have numbers uh, to share with you, um, but I do believe that um, in post-apartheid South Africa, a lot of progress has been made to make ex uh, education universal and accessible. It comes with a whole set of complexities around the limits of the state and its capacity. So, you know, Children in poor homes and communities can go and get an education for free in South Africa, in public schools. But the quality of education is the issue, is the big challenge. Uh, status functionality feeds into that in some provinces. Um, you know, schools don't have basic standards in place. So in some rural communities, school children are still sitting in wattle and dog houses and things like that and not in properly constructed schools. They don't have the proper infrastructure for an enabling environment to learn in. Um, so there's a lot of inequality even in the education system, which impacts. 
It's a dualistic education system. So on the other hand, you have fee-paying schools. And the fee-paying schools, interestingly, a lot of working class people in South Africa send their children there because of the quality issue. Students in South Africa have taken up a very important protest in 2015 and 2016 because the schooling thing is connected to higher education. And students have called for decommodified higher education. And the government provides a thing called NESFAS, which is a subsidy, uh, particularly for very uh, poor uh, students coming from very poor households, learning a threshold of under 20,000 rands, 120,000 rands in the household. And NESFAS has been completely inadequate to help these students with mobility out of the education system uh, into the second, uh, into the tertiary education system. Um, it merely helps with some fees. Most of these students don't have enough money to buy food. Uh, they don't have enough money to buy data, and so on. It's been awful. And so the student struggles are very significant right now to try and humanize access to higher education and so on. So that is the challenge. Yeah. So Vish, uh, I'm sure there's more questions, but we can carry on at the reception, which will be downstairs. downstairs all right? So I hope you'll all join me in thanking Vish. And